webinar uh, and it will be made available on the GTA website if you wanted to refer to it in the future. Uh, there's going to be time for Q&A at the end, so either uh, hold your questions to the end or please feel free to use the chat function on Zoom. If I could ask you to mute your uh, microphones if you're not speaking, that would be very helpful. Um, keep your video on, turn the video off, whatever works for you. And um, for those of you who have just joined us, uh, thanks very much. And I'm delighted to hand over to Neil. Great, thanks so much, Tom. Um, <clears throat> and thanks also to, to Daniel to helping set this up. Um, <clears throat> also on this call, just to, to clarify, we have Lucy Holmes and Stephanie Bradley from WWF with whom we're uh, also collaborating on this initiative. Um, what I'd like to share with you all uh, is a project we've been working on for several years now um, that essentially looks at how to finance fishery improvement work. Um, hopefully everybody can see my slide. Yes. Great. Um, <clears throat> we've essentially been working uh, with a range of different partners, initially with WWF and then with um, Ocean Outcomes. Um, Wilderness Markets is a, a small advisory firm based in the US. It's looking at how to scale capital into a variety of um, natural markets uh, focused principally in this case on fisheries. Um, we believe this is a critical model and it's critical to scale uh, sustainable fisheries and that we're focused on addressing the funding component to ensure that it's efficient, equitable, and cost-effective for the various stakeholders. Um, this model that we've developed with a range of different stakeholders should, we think, would be a leading model to drive a sustainable blue economy. Um, <clears throat> and we would value your thoughts and input, and we've left time at the end for that um, opportunity. As always, when it comes to investment strategies and um, investment discussions, especially out of the US, here's our uh, disclaimer. Um, and most importantly, um, to be clear that we're not providing any investment, legal tax or other financial advice. Uh, and um, you should all discuss it with your uh, legal counsel and uh, tax folks before engaging in anything as dangerous as this. And I say that tongue in cheek, obviously. Um, as we're all familiar, um, we take our livelihoods from the ocean. Um, the seafood industry is particularly dependent on the ocean, whether it's small scale fishermen or large scale tuna firms. Um, the health of the ocean, the health of our stocks is critical. Um, as we all know, a third of our stocks are overfished. And yet demand continues to grow, whether it's um, national demand or international demand. Um, demand for seafood products and high quality seafood products continues to grow. Unfortunately, most fish stocks can't take the additional pressure. Um, and that's something that we're all keen to try to address. In addition, fishing impacts marine ecosystems, habitats, biodiversity, um, and, under, and essentially un, undermining the resilience of oceans, particularly in the face of climate change. We also have a really big problem with uh, human trafficking and slavery and supply chains. Um, this is something that's, beca that's becoming uh, more and more of an issue and more and more consumers are aware of this as an issue. The 2019 um, trafficking report U.S. Department of State's trafficking report, trafficking in persons report, excuse me. Um, more than 40 countries have the risk of human trafficking associated in their seafood supply chains. So I think as we all know, um, these threats to nature and to people are also threats to our businesses. Some of the key threats from unsustainable seafood supply chains um, essentially the business risk of diminishing availability, uh, the loss of potential market access, um, and redu reduced access to capital as a consequence. Um, as more and more banks and financial institutions look at social and environmental metrics and more ESG type metrics, we see this becoming a bigger and bigger problem. 
from a legal perspective, IEU and slavery and seafood supply chains can result in corporate and personal liability, but they're also increasingly becoming part of the trade policy. Um, and then finally, there's the brand risk. Um, the brand risk and reputational damage from core custom bases, key stakeholders um, is a critical challenge that we're all having to address. These unsustainable fishing practices are bad news for the oceans, but they're also bad news for the companies and the profitability of the seafood industry. So that means that we all, businesses, finance, NGOs, face a common problem. If we want to turn all of this around, we need to keep our oceans and the fish stocks that keep businesses going healthy and safe for the long term. Fortunately, there is some good news in all of this. Um, seafood still has much promise. Uh, a number of different studies have demonstrated that um, better management, uh, more sustainable management could result in more seafood. And there are, according to the bank in their sunken billions report, fisheries is still an underperforming asset and they could generate an additional $83 billion in revenue if they were managed at sustainable levels. So if we turn all of this around, we can have more fish, healthier oceans, and make more money doing so. As you're all aware, there is a model that we can work with. Um, fishery Improvement Projects, or FIPS, are well-established mechanisms to move fisheries towards globally access acceptable standards and to create a time-bound pathway to recover ecosystems. Um, the first FIP was launched in 2002, and in 20 years, we now have over 157 fisheries and FIPS worldwide. And as you're all familiar, they're all tracked on fishery progress. Um, this is a fundamental basis and a fundamental tool in the process that we're proposing. One of the challenges we face in this space, though, is that FIPS are highly fragmented. Um, the funding of FIPS are highly fragmented and the budgets typically don't cover the true costs or the whole costs of implementing fishery improvement programs. Um, we've continuously, across a number of different FIPS that we've run a series of analysis, we've cons consistently seen these challenges and are seeking a way to try to address them. There are fortunately some interesting models out there to solve some of the uh, funding issues. Um, working with WWF, we wrote up a series of case studies, including of the National um, Fisheries Institute Crab Council model, in which, which covers the blue swimming crab fishery out of Southeast Asia. And 85% um, of blue swimming crab suppliers are part of this of the Crab Council. And they contribute in uh, 2021, three cents um, per pound into a, a central pool that is then granted back out to trade associate, I'm sorry, uh, trade associations and sustainability groups. Um, and in addition, WWF has a FIT participant program in which companies contribute a cent per pound uh, towards meeting the implementations of, of FIPS. These, these two models um, are interesting in as far as they go, but part of our work was to determine how can we use these to potentially scale up capital. At the same time, one of the big challenges we, we ran into was that um, SDG 14, which relates to the oceans, is one of the least, in, least invested in areas of all the SDGs. Um, and one of the challenges that we saw in doing so in our research was that there are essentially very few vehicles or mechanisms that allow um, impact investors to participate in this space. So our overall goal is to, is to find a way to scale global fisheries through an innovative approach that blends public, private and philanthropic investors. Over the last couple of years, we've been modeling and testing um, the feasibility of a concept that links different types of capital with um, philanthropic capital and industry 
um, into a fund model. The, the proposed fund would allow companies to mainstream sustainability into their business models, um, reduce the negative environmental and social impacts and address long-term seafood supply chain risks. Our goal is to try to raise $100 million in this kind of a facility. The central premise of the model essentially works across these four different categories. Um, the intention is working with companies uh, that are interested in, uh, in fishery improvement programs that result in measurable outcomes. So for example, uh, an MSC certification, we would secure upfront capital from public, private and impact investors partner with um, the seafood companies on volume-based commitments for those fishery improvements, which essentially provides the revenue stream. Um, we then work with service providers, which are essentially FIP implementers, whether it's Ocean Outcomes, WWF, or uh, SFP, or, or a range of different partners, uh, to deploy that capital to implement the fishery improvements and secure the outcomes we're looking for. And obviously, if this works, we can apply it to more and more fisheries and scale up the effort. This is a kind of closer in view of how the model would work. Um, we, through this fisheries improvement fund, would aggregate capital from various institutional, phil philanthropic and public sector investors um, seek to provide some form of a credit guarantee around that. Um, and, and we're looking to aggregate this capital from impact investors. We're not looking at the kind of 20% plus uh, hedge fund market here. Um, we would work with companies to secure the volume base fees, the off-take agreements. And with those in hand, work with specific service providers to implement FIPS across different markets. So um, as an example, given the costs of implementing uh, and obviously managing electronic monitoring commitments, the, the vehicle would pre-finance a number of those commitments with repayment to come based on the volume-based fees um, in the different fisheries. Essentially, this allows us to develop a, a pre-competitive co collaboration model and helps to drive down costs across multiple fisheries. In addition, um, we've identified a series of key impact metrics for the fund. Um, and it's important to distinguish between the impact metrics at the fund level versus at the fishery level. So while each fishery will be required to meet a series of impact metrics, primarily tied or to the MSC standard um, around principle one, two, and three, um, the fund itself is seeking to report on a number of metrics, which include social and environmental standards uh, to address uh, those challenges. So where are we in this whole process? Um, Going back a slide here. Um, we're currently in the stage now where we've we've completed we've completed a lot of work around the pipeline, pipeline development, and um, test the financial assumptions. We're now at the stage where we're engaging with companies uh, to uh, see if we can begin to actually test this out in the real world, begin implementation. Um, and we've been working closely with Daniel. Uh, to work with um, his relationship and the work that O2 has been doing with Bumblebee to, is to test out this model. We're seeking feedback uh, from different companies to, to see how we need to change or improve the, this approach. But our intention is to launch a pilot in 2021 in order to achieve, uh, to, in order to test whether or not it can scale. Um, at present, uh, having reviewed basically well over 250 different uh, fisheries, well, having identified well over 250 different fisheries and reviewed over 100 fisheries, we're focusing on fisheries at the larger scale 
um, in order to test the pilot. So initial um, approaches specifically in tuna are around the Indian Ocean and uh, Western Pacific. Um, and then there's some work also developing around small pelagics. Um, on the Western Central Pacific tuna pip, this is the one working with Bumblebee and um, FCF and essentially looking at how can we support the data collection, the adoption of precautionary harvest strategies and um, the ETP and retained species management measures. Um, it's important to note that we're not as a fund proposing to take over or do all of these for other parties. We're part of an ecosystem of experienced service providers and FIP implementers. And in this case, um, we will be working closely with Daniel and the team at Ocean Outcomes to implement this with, um, through their relationship with Bumblebee. Uh, another example is the Chilean um, pelagic fishery, which is um, uh, essential, which with a series of goals tied around mitigating bycatch, uh, decreasing illegal fishing, and this is being developed by WWF um, with a number of the large scale, small scale pelagic uh, firms. So for industry, um, we're looking to help stabilize the supply chain, um, drive down the costs of FIBS, support the efficient, equitable, uh, efficient and equitable industry engagement, um, help mitigate risk, and reach sustainability commitments. And we do this with a range of partners already in this, uh, in this sector. So with that, I'm gonna to come to an end. Um, we have put some questions up here that we'd be interested in your thoughts, comments, and feedback on. Um, and I would like to thank you and I'd like to, for your uh, time and thank Tom for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, yes, yeah, so, so just a, a note to the GTA uh, partners on the call. So as you know, the GTA doesn't currently work on uh, FIPS as, a, as an alliance, but the reason we thought this would be of interest to partners is that many of you are either sourcing from FIPS, both in tuna, but also other um, products. But you, you can also imagine that FIPS are going to be an increasing part of your sourcing going forward. So. This is why we thought it would be uh, particularly of interest to you, particularly the uh, the sort of the idea behind the financing. So um, we've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, so I'm very happy to open it up if anyone has any particular questions for Neil. Like I say, please use the chat box or um, put your hand up on the, uh, the Zoom thing or just shout out whatever works best for you. Maybe if I might, Daniel, if you wouldn't mind adding um, just a little bit around kind of what the interest is with uh, Bumblebee. Uh, sure. Um, I guess from a, um, a fisheries perspective and working with FIPS and MSC for a number of years, um, you know, Neil's outlined those challenges with regards to cost, um, and they really come to the fore when you're looking at an improvement project, which requires a lot of hardware development. So the GTA has a commitment um, for electronic monitoring, um, but installing the equipment on vessels is expensive. Um, so in our fit, you know, we're looking at 125, 150 vessels um, and, you know, installation costs are looking around 10,000 per vessel. So that upfront cost is very difficult um, to invest in without some form of, of, of um, model such as Neil's. So we found it incredibly useful from that perspective. Um, and what's more interesting from a scaling perspective is although we're working directly with Bumblebee, um, this model could be used as a pre-competitive collaboration. So some of the vessels that we're working on improving may supply um, other supply chains and um, processors or retailers um, could um, participate in that in a, in a quite structured way. Um, Whereas at the moment, we've got this huge amount of overlap of, of effort and cost in the supply chain and in the improvement. Um, so that's a little bit of um, why I think this you know, is particularly interesting for the GTA and a little bit um, much more into the detail of, of one specific improvement project. 
I've got a question come through on the chat. Um, how do we avoid free riders in this scenario? Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't avoiding. I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, it, it is a central. It is a challenge in the scenario. Um, the way we're tackling it during the pilot is we're working with specific fisheries in which we can essentially document that we have the majority of the companies and the majority of the stock, the, the seafood, um, in our model. Uh, we've looked at a number of fisheries where that is not assured and we've stayed away from those in the short run. That's also why we're looking at the more pre-competitive collaboration mechanisms so that we can engage with multiple partners in making this happen. Um, it is a concern and one that we're very aware of. Uh, and we're obviously targeting various elements of the supply chain in order to, um, to address that. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions from the audience? What are the plans going forward for um, the the uh, the group in in terms of taking this to other fisheries? Um, <clears throat> So at this point, we're shortlisting fisheries um, as part of a pilot initiative. Um, so if there are fisheries of interest uh, beyond the ones, <clears throat> well, for example, uh, that companies within the GTA might, would, might like to see in a pilot, we're open to doing that. Um, we're raising between five and $10 million to test this model in those pilot fisheries. Uh, once we've demonstrated that that works, hopefully, uh, in the next 24 months, we would look to scaling it to multiple fisheries with multiple partners. Right. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have any final questions for Neil? Yes, Lucy. Hi, Tom. <clears throat> um, I don't have a question for Neil, but I um, I did want to just maybe add one point on that last point about um, additional projects and how we kind of are trying to bring in uh, and create pipeline, um, which is you know critical to scaling this. As Neil has said, the idea is to to do this at scale, which is where. The efficiencies and really the benefits of the model actually really kick in but um but of course trying something out at a pilot level is is obviously fundamental to something quite innovative and um and so that's sort of the progression that we see um and we're obviously excited to try and see if we can get the pilot up and running this year um and we do have some projects in the pipeline that um that are looking quite promising but I think it's you know it's uh it's uh still true to say um and I guess you'd agree with this Neil that you, know, you can never have enough potential projects to evaluate for these this type of thing um and so I think part of the benefits of kind of engaging with this kind of audience is to see um if there's collective interest in specific fisheries that could potentially be eligible for the pilot or beyond, that's obviously something that we'll be really interested in knowing about and kind of potentially starting a conversation around. Um, I also appreciate that it's like a lot of information to take in at one time um, and you know, that maybe there's some follow up we can do to kind of look at and identify bits and pieces. Um, or answer any more detailed questions um, if there are any. Um, but just on that point around pipeline, I think you know that very much open, you know, from the concept building perspective to to more um, more potential opportunities that, that this might be able to work for. Is there a particular ask of GTA partners that you have? Uh, 
I think from our from our perspective would be um, how you think we might. Obviously, we don't have to have it today. We can also do it one on one or, or offline. Um, how we could strengthen such a model um, and where they might be interested in seeing it tested out. Great, thank you. And if anyone does have any thoughts on that, um, you know, please, if you if you do, let me know. I can forward them over to Neil. Okay. Um, well, no other questions have come in. So, uh, last chance for anyone. No, but if anything does come to you, please let me know, and I can uh, certainly share with Neil and the team. Um, I will say thank you very much for joining our webinar and a special thank you to Neil for presenting. Um, if you do have any feedback or anything like that, you'd, like, you'd prefer to speak to me about offline, you know where I am. Um, the next webinar will likely be on the Cape Town Agreement or on harmful subsidies. I'm uh, currently planning those at the minute, but do let me know if you have any suggestions for topics that you are interested in. So with that, I will wrap it up and say once again, thank you to Neil. Thank you for joining. And uh, the webinar will be, the recording will be up on our website very soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much. Yes.